Tonight's a hybrid with some people in person and also broadcasting the lecture via Zoom. And we're still trying to work out the kinks here, but uh, hopefully we'll just have these back in person in the fall. That's our plan at the moment. Our final lecture this season will be on May 4th with our speaker joining us by Zoom from Cheyenne to discuss monitoring local COVID trends through Wyoming's wastewater. So it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker tonight. Laura Hossman is a faculty member in the life science department here at Sheridan College, currently teaching anatomy and physiology and microbiology classes, but with an extensive repertoire of teaching a wide breadth of other science classes over her teaching career. Laura earned her master's degree in environmental biology at Arkansas State University while working in an EPA certified ecotoxicology research facility. In eight years at the laboratory, she worked on several projects funded by the USDA, the FDA, and numerous industries across the southeastern United States. These projects varied from EPA mandated biomonitoring and assessment of freshwater streams to population assessments of endangered freshwater mussels. Laura started teaching at Arkansas State University in 2006 and found her way to Wyoming as an instructor at Sheridan College in 2019. In her free time, Laura enjoys various hobbies, most of which involve horses, including trail riding, training, and chuck wagon racing. Tonight, her title is Ecotoxicology and Freshwater Stream Bioassessments. Laura, thanks for hanging in there with the logistics and uh, please welcome Laura Hossman. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Scott, for the introduction. Sounds like we're gonna have some feedback in here, uh, but thank you for um, thank you for your patience with the technology. I think maybe we've got that figured out. Um, thank you for asking me to talk. And uh, anytime I get asked to talk on a subject, I always wonder where do I start? I uh, never want to uh, assume that people know exactly what I'm talking about. And when I mention ecotoxicology, most people ask me what I'm talking about in the first place. So I'm gonna start at the beginning with this and what ecotoxicology is. All right, to know what that is, we need to understand a little bit about ecology. Ecotoxicology is studying the effects of toxicants on an ecosystem. So what exactly is an ecosystem? And um, ecosystems consist of several components. We've got just in this picture right here, an ecosystem with tons of organisms in it. Lots of them you can't see everything from the algae to the bugs in the water. We're gonna call them inverts, just so everybody knows. And the fish that feed on them. We've even got a bear in this picture. Um, so ecosystems can be really complex and uh, kind of have to be defined by the researcher as to how much you want to study because ecosystems can be really complex and can overlap and meld in with other ecosystems like the bear in this picture. I'm going to leave it out of the study because, well, I've got enough to study just in the water. And so um, I'm going to note that the bear is contributing to the system and maybe even taken from it and let somebody else study those contributions. So the researcher basically establishes the boundaries and, and the area that they want to include within their ecosystem. Because the ecosystem conclude, includes all the living and non-living components within the system. Now, ecology's central goal is to develop models that can explain and predict the distribution and the abundance of populations. Um, so it studies everything about them. In fact, in ecology, we study them at the organismal level, studying the organisms within the ecosystem. Some people will specialize just in a particular species or just within a particular assemblage studying maybe the algae in here and their contributions to the system, or maybe studying the fish in here, the particular adaptations they have, and then maybe taking that up to the population level, looking at their uh, breeding habits and their biotic potential, how big the population can get. And in studying that, we're gonna also be looking at all the interactions they have with the rest of the community, all the other organisms in here. And so ecology is huge. It studies all the relationships of organisms interacting with each other, along with the non-living parts of their environment. So it's way more than this food web that I'm sharing with you here. We always think about ecology. We think about trophic relationships, feeding relationships, but it includes way more than that. It includes competition. And so um, 
And if we completely understand all the components and the relationships within an ecosystem, then we can fill our goal and we can make predictions about what will happen if we get a flood in this area or what will happen if we get a drought or what might happen if we get an influx of a toxicant or I don't know, maybe just some salt water from a tide or something like that. So this is where ecotoxicology comes in. The term ecotoxicology was actually coined in 1969 during the big environmental revolution we had here in the US. The US kind of started around 62 when Rachel Carson wrote The Silent Spring. I don't know if some of you know what I'm talking about or not, but The Silent Spring was a book that got published noting the decline in songbird species. And it really made people environmentally aware because it was pollution and certain chemicals that were causing a decline in the populations. And so people started getting more aware. And then in 1969, the Cuyahoga River catches fire again. Yeah, I said again, the Cuyahoga River and uh, Cleveland, Ohio caught fire several times for the last time in 1969 because of the environmental revolution, the public decided we needed to do something about it. And Congress got onto it and started the clean water, started work on the Clean Water Act, which they signed in 1972. I know this is a lot of background information, but uh, the Clean Water Act is really why the reason the reason why we have ecotoxicology so well developed and um, and why we have these rapid bioassessment protocols. So the idea again in ecotoxicology is, is to understand the impacts of a single toxicant or maybe just an effluent. It was defined as a study of the fate and effects of a single toxicant, but with the Clean Water Act, it got applied really to point source pollution. Effluents that were being dumped into waterways, some of those effluents, even flammable, obviously. And so um, not we can make some assumptions from single toxicants, but sometimes it's easier just to assemble, just consider that there is a toxicant and just look at the effects in that effluent. As we further studied and got to addressing point sources, we started noticing that there was also a lot of pollutants coming in from non-point sources. So I threw this picture in to talk about runoff from urban areas, runoff from agricultural fields, even fertilizer can impact waterways. And so that's something we're gonna talk about a little later too. So, We've got our goal for ecotoxicology is to estimate or predict the effects of a toxicant or an effluent on a system. But the real principle in it is if we can protect the most sensitive species within a system, the ones that are most likely to be impacted by those pollutants, then we'll be protecting everything else in the system. So maybe if we're looking at some of those bottom of the food chain filter feeders um, that are really sensitive to chemicals, then if we're protecting them, we're protecting those that are feeding on them, if that makes sense. But so um, ecotoxicology selected some really sensitive species to develop some testing, standardized tests with. Some of the ones that are commonly used in uh, ecotox facilities are uh, Daphnia species, Saria Daphnia and Daphnia um, species are commonly known as the water flea. They're filter feeders. They feed on all kinds of plankton, bacteria and algae that are in the water. And as they're doing that, they're also taking in any kind of chemicals that are floating around in the water. They're also very sensitive to those things. Uh, we don't wanna just look at one trophic level though. So uh, the fathead minnow is often used. Pymephales promelis is the, known as the fathead minnow. It's a sensitive uh, carnivore. And so that takes it up a level on the trophic level. Uh, but we also have some other species too. Some toxicants are more likely to bind to organic matter in the stream like leaves and silt and detritus. And so Hyalella azteca is uh, used um, to also used in these tests. And then some of these toxicants end up in the sediment. So we want something that dwells in the sediment that might absorb those chemicals, either feeding on it or through the skin. Uh, Lumbriculus variegatus is a freshwater earthworm that lives in the sediment. So there's well-developed standardized tests for these sensitive species. And there's some others out there too, but these are the ones that are commonly used by the EPA today. 
freshwater toxicity tests developed by ecotoxicology are standardized now. Um, they're standardized to uh, control and, and make sure that the effects that we're seeing are related to the toxicant and not something else in our, in our test. Um, oh, let's see. Controls include the container size, like for those uh, little fathead minnows, we often use some pretty good size beakers or bowls. While well, for uh, the water fleet, those little bitty tiny solo cups, you might get some ketchup in at the, at the fast food restaurant uh, are just the right size for them. But we use the same size containers with the same volume of water in it to standardize. Um, the tests are stored in an incubator so that uh, the um, temperature stays stabilized throughout and at an optimum temperature for the organism. Uh, there's also light in those incubators to make sure that they have certain number of hours of light that they're exposed to and darkness. Oh, what they get fed, um, how much they're fed, this is all standardized for every chamber. The number of organisms that are in a chamber, the organisms themselves need to come from the same source, have the kind of the same genetics, so they'll have the same, uh, same type of response. And uh, so um, each of these things are replicated with certain number of organisms in the containers, and the, uh, even the age of the organism is standardized. We use those fathead minnows that are less than 24 hours old. Um, so they're usually cultured right there in the same lab you're doing the tox test and you're, you're um, mating males and females, harvesting eggs and hatching them off. And then you're using uh, young uh, fry that are less than 24 hours old. Same with the daphnids. They're cultured there in the lab and neonates are harvested off of them every 24 hours so that we've got really young. So they're not only sensitive species, but we're taking the most sensitive individuals, the neonates, and exposing them to effluents or toxicants or just sample waters in the case of the RBPs. So Whole effluent toxicity testing is the standardized method for these. There's uh, wet tests for all of these species that I talked about it that have been standardized, giving recommendations for containers and volumes, and even how, even certain dilutions. Um, uh, if we want to look at how toxic something is to these organisms, we want to do a dilution series. And I made a nice dilution series with something bright and colorful so we could kind of see what that is. Or we might be just taking effluent. Now, this is called whole effluent toxicity testing because lots of times we don't know the toxicant that's in the effluent. So we're just looking at the aggregate effects of the toxicants. And so we might take that effluent in 100% concentration and then cut it in half into a 50% concentration and a 25 and a 12.5, that kind of thing. So that when we do see effects, we can estimate the exact concentration that's causing the effects on the organism. Um, so here I have a dilution series of potassium permanganate. I actually did a lot of testing with that one uh, for, uh, with the USDA study and fate and effects of that in aquatic systems because it's used so often as an a aquaculture therapeutic. Um, but uh, so this standardized test can be used in lots of applications. I may just be taking sample water from different sites and exposing organisms to it at 100% concentration. Now I have my control and my dilution water of, uh, well, we call it synthetic water, water that's basically deionized and then all the salts are added back to it to make it a soft water, moderately hard or hard water, depending on the type of water your sample water is. So you've got a good control to compare the effects to, and you've got a good dilution water to dilute that out. Now, these tests, um, in these tests, we're looking at not just, um, not just lethality. Acute tests test for mortality rates. Acute tests are typically 24 to 48 hours long where organisms get exposed to the toxicant or the effluent for a short period of time. And they're little bitty young sensitive species. And so basically you put them in the water and count how many die at the different concentrations. Those are called acute tests, testing for mortality. Um, chronic tests tend to be longer, like seven to 10 to 14 or even 28 days, depending on the species you're dealing with. 
you want to give them enough time to either grow or enough time to age enough to reproduce. For example, with those water fleas, uh, the things we're looking at in a chronic test with them is when they start reproducing and how many neonates that they produce. Because in just seven days, the little tiny water fleas are reach their reproductive capacity. Actually, within about four days, they start reproducing. And so we can see if there's effects in the effluent compared to the control. The controls should be reproducing because that's what they're cultured in anyways. Uh, with the uh, fathead minnow and the uh, Hyalella and those little earthworms, we're looking more at their growth, if their growth was impacted. And so um, the controls are dried and weighed at the end of the test and compared to the, um, the ones in the test, con the treatment concentrations. So how this gets applied, uh, ecotoxicology and wet testing was developed in response to the Clean Water Act, mostly to address um, uh, point source permitting, um, NPDES permitting, so that uh, we're making sure that municipalities and industries that are releasing effluents are releasing something that's not too toxic or that it's getting diluted out well enough by the receiving stream. So that's where the whole wet testing came from and how it got applied. Now, Oh, let's see that again. That was 1972 when the Clean Water Act came out and this started getting implemented right away. By, 19, uh, by uh, 1980, we had significantly, significantly curbed uh, point source effluents and targeted the ones that were really bad and that kind of thing. And so um, uh, the EPA shifted their focus less to those point source discharges because they already had all the states working on those and focused it back to working on their 303D list. What's that, right? Um, the, 303D, the 303D section of the Clean Water Act uh, mandated that states were to set their water quality standards because water quality standards here in Wyoming would certainly differ th from that in Arkansas because it's a totally different eco region, right? And so states are supposed to set their water quality standards, then go test all of their waterways and list the ones that aren't meeting those standards. Well, the states were kind of throwing their hands up in the air. How do we do that? A lot of states jumped right on it. Um, uh, Minnesota, Missouri, even Wyoming jumped right on it and started developing their own protocols for testing the waterways. And that's where these uh, rapid bioassessments came from. The EPA realized they were gonna have to, have to help all of the states develop a standardized way to do this. They can do it their way if they want to, but the RBPs were a cost-effective, a cheap way and a timely way to sample a lot of streams in a single season to get some water quality data. So now, uh, the EPA's RBPs are often used in conjunction with ecotoxicology because if we do see that the waterways aren't reaching their water quality standards, if they are on that 303D list, then um, you know ecotoxicology can be applied to maybe even find out what the toxin is or where it's coming from by testing several different sites along that waterway. So what all does the uh, RBPs contain? The elements of any kind of biomonitoring program really needs uh, three components to it. There's three components to ecological integrity. You've got the habitat quality itself. Now I'm not just talking about just how beautiful it is, but you know, what is the habitat? What is the substrate and what is the water quality like? Are there trees around it? That kind of thing. Um, water quality and habitat are two different things, but they are directly related to each other. Habitat affects water quality and water quality determines the habitat that your aquatic organisms are growing in. And so these, all the three of these things are related to each other. Even the biological community affects the habitat available to other organisms. And even the biological community affects water quality. Like those filter feeders are really good at cleaning up the water, for example. So any biomonitoring program is gonna include all three of those components because they are so influential on each other. 
So biosurvey techniques like RBPs, RBPs spell out how to sample the habitat, how to sample the water quality, and how to sample the, um, the uh, biological community. So biosurvey techniques are sampling the biological community, but you're also taking those other parameters too because one can explain the other. Uh, RBPs advocate that integrated assessment so once you've got your biosurvey data of your community, you need to compare it to the habitat that it's in because, well, you want to compare apples to apples, right? So um, these two streams here from Wyoming definitely wouldn't be a good comparison to each other. We've got one out in the high desert while another one's coming off the mountain stream. So that's totally different habitat. So you collect habitat data and water quality data along with your biosurvey techniques. And so what do we compare it to then? Uh, we need some sort of reference condition, uh, something to set our water quality standards in the first place. Or if we think that a stream is impaired, what do we compare it to to really assure that it is? affected. And so reference conditions, and I'm going to read this, this is the definition of reference conditions represent the natural range of variation in minimally disturbed water quality and habitat conditions. So if we sample a reference stream with a similar, e from a similar eco region, um, uh, from a similar area with a similar structure, the same stream class, then we can compare our biotic community to one another to see if there's a difference, if that makes sense. Now, reference sites often include sites on the very on the exact same stream. Um, for example, sometimes we don't have a really good reference stream to compare to, and maybe we're just setting water water quality standards. So, lots of times we'll take a, a oh. For a, for a certain study where we're looking at the effects of effluents, we're gonna be testing downstream of those effluents and comparing it to upstream might be our reference site. Now, most states now by this point have developed a lot of reference streams that they think are representative of these conditions here uh, in for certain eco regions. But still to get the same size stream type and everything, you're still gonna to have to select some certain sites along those streams to sample to make a good comparison. All right, let's look at the biosurveys. That's the fun part of it. While benthic macroinvertebrates have proven, I mean, very initially in the very first biosurveys, uh, invertebrates, your bugs in the stream, proved to be a useful assessment tool. Um, in fact, every state agency, every state environmental quality agency has a expert on benthics, usually more than one, uh, because they're sampled and the, just the community of the invertebrates can give you a good example of sensitive species. It, can, uh, it addresses all the different trophic levels, plus inverts they represent several different life cycles. They have several different life cycles that they live within the stream. And they spend some of those life cycles right there. They don't migrate much. So they're always exposed to the same thing over time. Now, um, most biosurveys are going to include more than just one assemblage, not just your inverts. Uh, a lot of people are really concerned about fish. And so uh, fish are a good, a good thing to survey too because they can represent insectivores, carnivores, and omnivores. Plus they're at the top of the food chain. So any effects going on down here should be affecting your fish population too, right? Um, plus fish, they can migrate. And so uh, they can move away from areas that are polluted. So if they're not there, that might indicate something as well. So each of these has their advantages. The EPA's RBP manual also includes paraphyton, your algae, uh, diatom, soft algae, and cyanobacteria. Uh, it's also suggested because it has its advantages. They have such a quick reproduction time, they can quickly uh, show you acute effects of, of toxicants and effluents. Um, the sampling's really easy. And so they and and they do make really valuable indica indicators of short term or acute effects. 
Um, advantages to the benthic macroinvertebrates, I think I've kind of already addressed, but another advantage to it is, is states have already been using this so much, they've already really got a lot of stream data for your benthic macroinvertebrates to compare to, and some suggested matrices for them. Um, and sampling paraphyton and benthos are not going to really affect your community. Taking a subsample of them from a single site is not going to affect the whole community. Um, fish has its advantages, again, because they're at the top of the food chain and they do have several different trophic levels and sensitive species. They are good indicators, but in sampling fish, sometimes you can kind of impact the community itself by taking a certain number of those individuals out of it. Now, I should include that other by other assemblages can be included. Um, uh, sometimes we do uh, look at uh, birds that are along the stream, or even let's take it to the micro level, looking at different bacteria that are within the stream or within the sediments. Uh, but those three are what are included in the RBPs. Now, bioassays are looking more at the habitat portion of it. Um, bioassays makes a matrix that assesses habitat on several different levels. Um, it's based on some key characteristics of not just the water body itself, but the surrounding area. Um, includes uh, all types of habitat parameters that would affect habitat availability to your uh, aquatic individuals. So um, it includes parameters like stream characterization. Now I have to elaborate on that. How do I characterize the stream? Well, first I'm gonna be talking about the stream type. Is it intermittent? only flows during the springtime maybe, or does it get tidal flows at all? Does, um, uh, is it close to the coast and gets some tidal input? That's, uh, that's part of the subsystem. And where does it come from? What's its origin? What are the tributaries that feed it? All of those things are noted. Uh, watershed features. That includes uh, land use around the area. Is it agriculture or is it forest? Does it run through the national forest or is there, uh, are there soybean fields on either side of it? That type of thing. Um, also noting any type of erosion that might occur, uh, what the banks look like. In-stream features are looking specifically at the water level um, the width of the stream, the depth of the stream, how quickly the water is flowing through there, the volume of water that's actually passing through the area. We would also be looking at the high water mark that's commonly met during the wet season and uh, those types of things uh, for in stream features. Oh, including too, I need to include this, is canopy cover. Uh, how much, what percentage of the stream is shaded, that really affects the biota that's in the habitat. Um, so riparian vegetation is the vegetation that grows along the banks. Uh, aquatic vegetation is the vegetation growing in the water. All of this stuff is recorded. Um, the sediment or the substrate, is it rocks? Is it gravel? Is it sand? Is it silty, detrital matter? And then the water quality itself. We did say water chemistry is kind of its, uh, its separate um, assessment, but water quality is sampled along with the uh, habitat itself because it's so entwined with that. Now, station siting is fun. This is where you get to pick your sites. How do you pick your sites? Well, it really depends on the purpose of your study. When we get to the end of this, I'll talk about all the different program applications that RBPs have. But we might be doing this study because there's some point source discharges and this person's wanting to renew their permit and we wanna see if there's any effects of their effluent downstream, okay? So we would select our site downstream of this effluent and we'd probably select a reference site above it, okay? If we're doing this for that 303D list and we're just trying to check the water quality of the entire stream, then we might need to assess the entire water body, what types of point source inputs there are and non-point source like confined animal feedlots, their runoff and that sort of thing, and select sites according to that. 
Um, and then we would also need to think about our reference stream too and what we want to compare our data to. Do we have a reference stream here on this water body or reference site on it? Or we're gonna have to select a similar stream in, within the eco region to use. Our site selection can be uh, also influenced by other things like accessibility. Yeah, we might have the ideal place we want to sample at, but getting there. So places where there's highways at are, are oftentimes used. Um, of course, we do our sampling upstream of those bridges or those crossings and things like that. But accessibility is an issue. Again, point source and non-point source that port source uh, pollution that is known is also taken into account. All right, now the fun begins. Um, now the fun begins weather permitting. And I've done some of this stuff in the winter time when the water's actually freezing on your gloves. That's not, that's not fun. We do a lot of our sampling in the summertime when the weather is really nice for actually getting down in the water and doing your sampling. And uh, so once your sites are selected, you gotta get out there and mark your site and start taking your samples. So to do that, you want to standardize your site. Typically, the RBP manual suggests about a 100 meter reach along the stream, because about a 100 meter reach is going to cover the different things like riffles and runs and pools that you would find in that stream. You're likely to find that within a 100 meter reach. Depending on your stream type, you might choose 150 or a 200 meter reach. Okay. And then you want to make your transects along that. If it's a hundred meter reach, typically you'll make 10 meter transects. Every 10 meters, you'll flag this. And you might see those flags in this picture right here. What that does is makes it easier for the observer to estimate the percentage of ripples to runs and estimate the percentage of type of substrate that's there. And so we sample along each transect to make sure we're sampling all of that habitat within that hundred meter reach. So habitat data itself is collected at each transect. We'll go down along through there, looking at the stream banks, measuring the flow, measuring depth. Thanks Scott for some of these pictures. Here's some guys working on measuring the depth and measuring flow through an area. Um, while, um, and water chemistry is done too. Not necessarily at every site or every, every transects, but at every site, water is collected for further analysis in the lab. And some parameters are taken right there in the stream, like temperature and dissolved oxygen, things that are gonna change if you just put it in a bottle and stick it in the cooler. You wanna measure those things on site. Conductivity and that type of, of thing is measured on site. And then water samples can be stuck in a cooler and further analyzed back at the laboratory for things that are a little harder to carry along with you. Um, uh, sediments are also sometimes sampled, like in this particular area here, we've got a bunch of rocks and gravel. Those typically aren't sampled, they're just noted as that. But if we're sampling a stream with a lot of mud and sand and silt, we might even want to characterize that because that characterizes the habitat available to those benthics that get down in that. And so we'll take sediment samples, a core sample to take back to the lab and do particle size assessments and volatile solids on that type of thing. Um, each of the transects along that 100 meter reach are sampled for invertebrates because we want to make sure we're sampling every bit of that habitat for our bio survey. So transects sampled for invertebrates are used, done using various methods. It is kind of standardized uh, between sites. We want to use the same method between sites. Okay, But there's different methods you might choose to use. Um, some, uh, some samplers are filled... Uh, Technicians like using the D frame. Some like using the big rectangular frame because it has a bigger net on it. Some prefer using the uh, Cerbers or the Hess frame that actually sit down in the water and kind of square off a certain area that you can go through and stir up the substrate and catch all the bugs that come up out of that. Uh, so whatever method is used is used at all the sites so that it is standardized. And we wanna spend the same amount of time sampling invertebrates at every site. So we don't get a bigger sample at some sites than we do others because we want everything to kind of be, again, standardized. We wanna make sure we're comparing those apples to apples. Sampling fish is really fun. I've done this a few different ways. 
Um, electroshocking is what is suggested by the RBP manual because it's the most effective at getting a sample of all the different fish. If you're seining or trying to catch them with a net, there are some fish that can readily evade that. And so you're not gonna get a sample of everything. But in some situations, you've got to revert to a kick seine or a seine or some types of nets because, well, electro, you have to have a permit for electroshocking and electroshocking isn't always allowed on streams, especially streams with threatened or endangered species in it because yes, electroshocking can kill your fish, especially your little ones, especially those little sensitive ones. So whatever method you're using, whichever type of back, of uh, shocker you decide to use, you're gonna use that at all your sites. Backpack shockers are nice because you can get down in a variety of streams with that. Um, trying to think of the name of it. The little floating shockers are nice because you can have several probes and several collectors. That's something else we wanna standardize too. We wanna make sure we've got the same number of people going along with the shocker, picking up the fish so that we're getting about the same size sample at each of our sites. Uh, fish are usually ID'd on the site because that way they can just be released back into the water. Electroshocking doesn't always kill them, just kind of shocks them, paralyzes them for a second so that we can collect them, uh, identify them, and quantify them. Sometimes it, uh, it, certainly in the beginning, RBPs wanted you measuring and weighing those fish, whereas now they're more quantifying them, just counting them of each species. They're identified two species. So I've sat on the stream bank for hours with an ID book, um, counting fish and throwing them back in. And then I've also taken a Ziploc bag and thrown samples into the Ziploc bag to take back to the lab to further ID, either because there were just too many to go through or we didn't know what one of them was. We know there were 20 of them, but we don't know exactly what it was. And so we would bag it and take it back as a sample to ID to species because individual species names are important for a metric. All right, now let's talk about analysis back at the laboratory. Man, this can be extensive. Again, it depends on the purpose of your study and it depends on your suspicions. Things you might've come across in your sampling might make you decide to do further analysis on things. Um, so water chemistry and sediment characterization can be really elaborate. Uh, sediment characterization often includes particle size estimates. You're estimating the percent sand and silt, for example, uh, because that, cat that classifies that substrate as, as a particular habitat. So you'll have your percent silt and sand. Um, and in some instances, we might want to be testing the sediment for toxicity, especially if there's effluents going in there and, and toxicity is suspicious. Uh, uh, is a suspicion, then we'll take those sediments and, and set up some toxicity tests with them back at the laboratory. Kind of the same thing with the water quality. Now there's a bunch of water quality we can do. There's so much water quality, and so many parameters you can test with water quality. If you suspect, for example, that there's mercury in there, then you might be testing for mercury. That's typically not the suspicion. We're just wondering, is it toxic or not? And so we look at uh, dissolved oxygen, conductivity, um, turbidity, a lot of that is done on site. And then we bring the samples back to do alkalinity and hardness that are titrations that take a little more time and equipment. Um, nutrient levels, phosphates, nitrates, uh, nitrites, uh, that type of thing is, uh, is often included. And then again, depending on your purposes, study what other types of parameters you might add. All right, analysis of the paraphyton. Paraphyton assemblages can be uh, measured a lot of different ways. And I should mention too, sometimes uh, back when we were sampling, if paraphyton is something we're doing, sometimes we'll add some artificial substrate into the stream to collect the paraphyton for it to actually grow on. Um, and then other times it's just grabbing a water sample and taking those samples back to the laboratory and putting them on a microscope. Because yeah, that algae's tiny. And to be able to tell what type of algae it is, we've got to see it on a microscope. Diatoms are usually a big proportion of it. Diatoms are the hard algaes that have those cell walls made of silica. They're really pretty and come in some kinds of geometric shapes. 
Your soft algaes include your green algaes and your cyanobacteria. But that's not enough. We do identify them down to species because with this data, um, so we can get metrics like number of species found, species richness, number of taxa found, percent of hard-bodied algae to soft-bodied algae. We can get those metrics. But with paraphyton, we know which algaes tend to grow in what types of water because they've been so well studied. We can take the, uh, the species that we found and actually calculate up some diagnostic metrics that, tell, that can tell us things like if there's eutrophication in the water or if it tends to be, if you've got a bunch of acidophiles living in it, that it tends to get a lot of acid into it, for example. Uh, if there's a bunch of aberrant diatoms, those are diatoms that have weird shaped shells. Their, their cell walls don't look exactly like they're supposed to, so they're abnormal. Uh, that's another diagnostic metric. Now, we also want to quantify them. So the way we quantify them is we're identifying them to species. We're not going to go through that whole water sample to count every single algal cell. We might count three, four, or 500 of them, and we do relative abundance, like half of them were diatoms, or 10% of them were chlamydomonas species, for example. So, and then all of those metrics, again, can give us, can in, uh, infer some other things with those diagnostic metrics. Analysis of invertebrates are very time consuming. I have spent hours in front of a microscope. All my microbiology students wonder how I can just walk up to a microscope and immediately get it in focus. It's from years of working on a microscope. Um, you take these samples back to the lab from the field and you've got to wash them off because they have tons of leaves and silt and sand, sediments in them. Wash them off and you pick the bugs out. That's what we called it, picking bugs. We could spend hours picking bugs in a day. We'd pick the bugs out and I got pretty good at identifying them after you see them so many times and you hear that somebody telling you what they are, you kind of learn them. But um, you're gonna have your resident expert look at them to actually identify them to species and quantify them. Um, and yeah, having one of those little hand counters where you can tick, 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 tick along is good because there's that many benthos to go through. The metrics that we come up are things like species richness, how many different species were there or how many different genera were there or which percent of the sensitive species like an EPT index is looking at ephemeroptera, pycoptera and trichoptera species that's your caddis stoneflies, caddis flies and mayflies. These sense, what percentage of them were that because that in itself is kind of a diagnostic metric slightly. Um, so it gives you a percentage of tolerant or by recording them to species, you can calculate at metrics like percent tolerant organisms, percent um, sensitive species, percent. We can also look at the trophic levels, the percent filter feeders, the percent grazers, the percent clingers. That's looking at their substrate. Fish analysis, again, they're often identified weight and measured right there on the stream bank. But again, I did mention sometimes some samples are taken back. Um, the metrics that we look at with them, again, are the species richness um, and, and quantity of relative abundance. So we might be looking at uh, percent of darters. Darters are sensitive species that often are related to good ecological integrity. There's a darter here. Uh, there's several different darter species and we might be looking at particular darter species as well or it may just be saying percentage of darters. Percentage of intolerant species or sensitive species is another way to say that with fish they call them intolerant for some reason. Um, percent green sunfish kind of gives you the percent of tolerant species. Green sunfish tend to be really abundant in, in impacted waters they're not impacted by those things. Percent omnivores, insectivores, and carnivores is telling you about the trophic levels. So those are some of the metrics that we could record from getting our species numbers, uh, our species list and numbers of those. 
All right, now what do we do with all this data? Because it's a lot, trust me. You've got a clipboard full of infra habitat data. You've got a clipboard full of water quality data. And then you have clipboards full of data for your algae, data for your inverts, and data for your fish. What do you do with this? Now, uh, we want to look at the metrics. And community structure can be determined from those metrics. We want to make sure we have good representation of all the different trophic levels, for example. Uh, this is telling you about the community structure. And we had already said, if we can understand the, eco the ecosystem and the community structure, then we can make predictions or assumptions about what type of impact there is there. Okay, so that's the whole goal with all of this data. Okay. Um, total number of taxa, percent dominant taxa, number of sensitive taxa are all important in quantifying biological diversity. That's typically how we measure ecological integrity is good biological diversity. Lots of different species are found in healthy systems. That's true for all ecosystems, not just aquatic ones. So um, that biological data, these metrics are used to compare sites to each other as well as to those reference sites. And if they're significantly different and you have a lot less biodiversity at one site than your others, then that site is most likely impacted. But that other data you got is also important because we also took habitat and water quality data. Those metrics might help point as to what the problem is and why the community was different. All right, so this, I've got to back back up. This last slide says RBP suggests a multi-metric approach. We want to use more than just one metric, not just reporting sensitive species, but we want to be sure to use a lot of different metrics that help to quantify biological diversity. But the metrics that we use are going to be dependent upon the stream classification. Now, what am I talking about? Stream classification has a whole lot to do with that characterization we were doing. We want to make sure we're comparing apples to apples. Okay. So while some states have, um, have a classification system established for eco regions, um, it really includes more than just eco regions. It also includes, for example, in mountainous states, they include elevation into that. Uh, the, the flow regime, um, how much flow is actually passing through an area. So stream classification is defined in many states, it, but it aims to group sites together so that you are comparing apples to apples. You want sites that are homogenous and have the same type of habitat, the same type of water quality, and the same type of community that should be there so that you are comparing the same things together. Now, as we go to sampling, we might find out that our sites aren't really as similar as we thought they were when we were doing our site selection. So that's part of the reason why our metrics help us to determine the classification. The actual, <laughs> so our stream classification tells us which metrics to use, but our metrics tell us which stream classification it is. So this is a calibration process. We're using our data to decide how to classify the stream to decide which data to report. So we're using our data to figure out which data best represents the community, if that makes sense. Now, uh, multiple metrics, once we select our metrics, those metrics are combined. Sometimes, um, sometimes we're even combining habitat with our biota or we're combining the different assemblages together. Sometimes the metric is just for our benthic invertebrates. Okay, but multiple metrics are used. We're going to use several different metrics from our assemblage and habitat and chemical data to come up with an index value. An index value is basically a formula that you build out of your metrics that gives you this number. And then uh, if your index value at your site is below a certain value, then your biodiversity is strong enough. You don't have enough ecological integrity there. An aggregation of metrics into an index gives a single value that can determine if there's impairment or not, if we need to do something about it or not. Um, there are lots of different indexes out there that have already been developed for certain classifications of streams. Um, an index of biological integrity 
is the is what we call an index that is capable of giving us that value at which impairment is determined. Now, back when I was a student first started doing this, I was like, somebody tell me the IBI because you know, my uh, advisors and everything were talking about this IBI that I need to use to compare my sites. And so I'm like, where do I look it up at? What are the metrics that I use? Well, come to find out, I'm the study itself may establish the IBI for that stream. An index of biological integrity is an index that uh, is kind of determined by the stream classification, by the metrics that you're going to use. There are a lot of IBIs out there for certain regions. There wasn't one for me. I had to develop my own metrics or decide on my own metrics and select an index value that was the IBI for that region. Once they're calibrated, this calibration process is picking the right metrics and putting them together to come up with an index. Once they're calibrated, index values can be used to determine if the stream is impaired, again, by if that value isn't high enough, if, it's, if it is significantly different. So yeah, I'm talking about some statistics. I always stutter on that word. Statistics with this one. Comparing my numerical data, if it's significantly different, then there's impairment. Um, and we do that. Uh, we do that because we have significant amount of data, usually several samples, and we use a 95 percent uh, 95 percent confidence interval, and use a NOVA in comparison to data. So this kind of circles back to what I started with when I was talking about an ecosystem. Once a relationship between habitats and water quality and the biological community that's there is determined or understood, then biological criteria can be used to better discern if there's impairment. You know, once I've done enough studies on what the stream should look like, then eventually, eventually states will have enough data they can go in and look for one particular thing. And if they don't find it, then streams impaired. They don't, tip, they're not, they don't typically do that. We're still using these bio surveys to sample kind of everything. All right, how do we report our data? Um, you know, historically, when RBPs came out, the reports were like your lab reports you do for science class. The reports were very scientific and they focused on the data that was related to the permit or, or the objective of the permitting because the first RBPs were used for those, not, those point source permitters. And so it was only using the data that was relevant to the particular objective. Now these reports include all the data. It includes all the habitat and water quality data and all the bio, bio survey data. But the uh, uh, formatting style, um, has also kind of changed. Instead of being really scientific, just reporting to um, just reporting to other scientists, now these reports are written more to address the environmentally aware public, um, members of Congress, and uh, and other ecologists. So it is kind of a we try to make them where they're a little easier to read and we use lots of graphical tools, of course, in any type of science with any type of science data graphical tools are great for showing the correlation of data. With the examples here I've got a couple graphs relating taxa richness species richness to habitat. This is very visual here. It's not even numerical data. Where here is a more standard type of graph relating the IBI to forest land cover. And I've also seen these graphs where the IBI is correlated to the habitat quality. Well, how do you quantify habitat? We did when we were doing our study and at each of those transects recording the percent of riffles and runs and shade and all of that, we can put a numerical data, a numerical uh, number to that and quantify it so that we can numerically compare those metrics. All right, so what's the application of RBPs now? Again, initially they were first made, they were, RBPs were first made to assess the effects of effluence, point source, uh, point source effluence on streams. But um, RBPs were developed more to address the water quality list. I talked about it for uh, the 303D list, 
But first, the clean water section, the 305D list is water quality assessment. Slip back here. The uh, 305D list is a list of water quality for uh, it, the, each state reports biennially. And um, the National Water Quality Inventory is reported uh, biennially, biennially. And so it uh, establishes the process for being able to, re to collect and record the water quality data. So RBPs are used for that, sampling the water quality. Habitat and other things are assessed with that because they're all three related to each other. So um, the Clean Water Act Section 319, okay? Now, the Clean Water Act first addressed point source dischargers, but by 1980s, we realized there was a bunch of non-point source uh, pollution that was getting into streams, runoff from agricultural uh, production, uh, confined animal feedlots or agricultural fields or urban runoff, stormwater runoff even is non-point source. So this amendment to the Clean Water Act was made in uh, 1987 and RBPs were implemented onto that to test for non-point source pollution. We can do uh, these RBPs below an area where we suspect pollution or we might even locate the pollution using those toxicity tests in these RBPs. Uh, watershed protection, that program was developed for, to help protect our surface waters from contamination and ground waters as well. And uh, RBPs are done on it to assure the water quality of those areas. I've already talked about the 303D list. It was really first uh, developed as a for the TMDL process, that's the total maximum daily load. How much effluent can we dump into this stream of this size? How big of a buffer does it have? And so, um, so RBPs can be used to establish what is the total maximum daily load that we can release effluents into that stream without having impacts by testing downstream versus upstream or sampling upstream versus downstream. This is commonly done with NPDES permitting, and this is where I've done a bunch of toxicology tests. NPDES permitting is uh, where someone seeks to get a permit for effluent discharge, like wastewater treatment plants that dump their treated water into a receiving stream. They have to have a permit for that. And to get their permit, they have to meet certain water quality standards with their effluent, and they also have to do biomonitoring to make sure that downstream is not impacted by their effluent. Even if they're meeting their water quality standards, they still might be letting something go that's affecting the community. So RBPs are done for that. In fact, that right there is what I did my thesis work on was a municipal um, water treatment plant trying to look for renewal of their permit. Uh, ecological uh, risk assessments, RBPs are used for those. Studying a system, looking at the community before any impact is made whatsoever. If we know what the community looks like and we study all those relationships, we can make assumptions or make predictions about what the impact will be if we add, I don't know, a parking lot upstream or another wastewater treatment facility or allow somebody's industrial effluent to enter this, will it have an impact? Ecological risk assessments are done for all kinds of things from mining to uh, permitting or giving permits to build a new plant. And lastly, the US EPA water quality criteria and standards. This is mandated by the EPA for all states to establish their own water quality criteria and enforce them and maintain those standards and report any waterways that are not meeting those standards. All right, does this look like fun to you? It really is. I uh, spent several years doing it because I really enjoyed it. The field work is what I like best to get out in, in the field and do the samplings. If this sounds like fun to you, bioassessments have a lot of applications. Hopefully that last slide kind of showed you that. There's state agencies that do bioassessments, municipalities, industries themselves might hire a team to do a bioassessment for them so that they can seek a permit or something like that. So um, there's, lots of, uh, there's lots of demand for bioassessments and they do require a team. 
It takes a lot of people to get out there and do some electrofishing or uh, collect invertebrates. And it takes some that are experts in the field. If you like identifying bugs, man, there is a job for you, okay? Not for me. I've picked enough bugs. Uh, we, even some that specialize in the statistics. Now, usually there's a lot of overlap. I was a field technician. I did lots of sampling and then I took things back to the lab and I did all kinds of toxicity tests. I did my own st statistics on those and um, I was not a biotic expert. I had some really good colleagues that we kind of traded work. I'll help you on your project if you'll help me on mine kind of thing. And so I had some um, experts in fish, experts in the inverts. And yeah, I had kind of had to do my own on the microbiology stuff, the algae, so. Well, um, I hope that this has been informative to you and maybe excites you about the idea of bioassessments. Before I stop anywhere, I've got to give some thanks. I want to thank um, Arkansas State University's ecotoxicology facility, the place where I worked for so many years, for giving me a bunch of these pictures because over the years I've lost them and well, I had to make a phone call. And Scott, thank you also for contributing some of those pictures. Also listed here a bunch of references. If you're interested in doing this, this book tells you exactly how to. This is the manual for the RBP. And then some uh, manuals on toxicity testing and then some background information on the Clean Water Act and that type of thing is in here. So um, you guys have some questions for me. Any questions from Laura? Again, you could submit those through the chat or the Q&A box, or um, I'm not sure our folks are in the room. We've got a few. Great. I'll start by saying that I've been, uh, I've been taking my ecology field class out for years uh, to do some basic uh, macroinvertebrate sampling in different streams and trying to, you know, compare two different streams in terms of their macroinvertebrates. And all I can say is I have I have a lot to learn. <laughs> There's a lot more we could be doing. So this was really informative, Laura. I'm excited to uh, I'm excited to expand some of the things we're thinking about, but um, maybe also bring you along for some of those for some of those small studies. All right. Yeah, I feel like there's a lot more I could have talked about here, but I was trying to kind of keep it short. And wanted to leave plenty of time for you guys to ask me questions. There we go. I can see one in the chat box. I'll read it out from, uh, from Jessica. What if a water source becomes too toxic suddenly to accommodate life sources and can spread? So, um, so typically those sites are identified rather quickly that um, we would look for the source of it to try to shut it down. Um, that was the case several years ago. Again, the reason for the Clean Water Act uh, there are still some waterways that are still not fishable or swimmable, um, which is, was the whole goal of the Clean Water Act, was to make all of our waterways both fishable and swimmable. They didn't even really set water quality standards. They just wanted, every, wanted the aesthetic value of it and to be able to play in it. There's still some waterways that are not that, that have not yet reached that status. That Cuyahoga River is still not there, for example. Um, but... Uh, we, we want to look for the source to try to shut it down because anybody releasing effluents, releasing toxicants into a string should have a permit for that. And the permits are designed so that the, that the, the stream can receive so much toxicants, it'll dilute them out and it won't really affect the community. If they're exceeding those limits, then they're going to get fined, um, a really, really hefty fine. I hope that answers your question. If not, please let me know. States, I should mention that states are responsible for their own enforcement. While it is EPA mandated, individual states are given the authority to enforce this. And the, I, think, I think even Wyoming calls it their Department of Environmental Quality has a certain number of officers that are enforcers of this that go out looking at sites, specifically in places where they have permitters, and looks for those things to make sure that the habitat quality doesn't look degraded and um, that things are still looking good.
Yes. When it comes to testing, is there a lot of testing done outside of the rivers when it when it uh, pollution affecting an ecosystem, or is it mostly focused around like how the water source comes into play? Um, I'm not sure I understand. Well, uh, you were mostly focused around like how uh, uh, microorganisms in the water, but is there a, is there much testing done like outside, like in in say a forest, if there was like a factory? Oh, yeah. we go outside that stream? Yeah. So um, with within the within the RBP, we're looking several meters along the stream banks. We're looking out looking out 100 meters to assess potential non-point sources and land use and all of that. Um, we're not evaluating the terrestrial, uh, rep, uh, riparian vegetation is the only thing that gets assessed in the RBP. But, um, but we're looking for things that might be contributing to it. Maybe that answers your question. And if we find something, or if we find something in the water that points to something that might be outside that 100 meters that we didn't see, we go looking for it. Okay. Good question. Yeah, Adam, where do you draw that line? Go ahead, Scott. Another question here from someone online. This is from Kathy. E. coli seems to be the focus on determining stream quality. Is it a reliable standalone indicator? I don't know how reliable it is as a standalone. It is often included in these RBPs. It is often in the water quality test. I've done some of those fecal coliform samples. We did them though specifically in tests where we suspected sewage effluent was a problem. Like we got out on a site we didn't suspect anything, but we got out there and, we're, and along our transect, we saw this stuff running in. And so that gave us the suspicion of that. So we included fecal coliforms in that entire study, not just that site, but we also wanted to compare it to the reference site as well to make sure that they weren't significantly different. Um, it's also oftentimes included in uh, municipal plant effluent permit tests uh, as well. To, now, there shouldn't be any fecal coliforms in their effluent, but if, if they're treating it right, but there's lots of things that can affect their treatment, like a big stormwater surge or something like that. So I, I really don't know the answer to that question. I don't know how good of an indicator it is standalone. Probably not a real good one standalone. We would expect to find fecal coliforms in most streams but it might be a really good metric to include depending on the type of stream you're looking at. Great, any other questions from folks in the room or online? Uh, Let's see, it looks like in the Q&A box from Chelsea Victoria, is there something that contributes to water toxicity more so than other things? If that makes sense. Um, oh man, it, it, uh, your, your question does make sense. Um, there's some things that I can mention that we specifically look for because we know that they are, for example, nutrients. Uh, nutrients themselves, you think, well, that's a good thing. Well, too many nutrients actually cause eutrophication and, and impairs the habitat within the stream. Um, and nutrients are commonly uh, considered pollution because they do run off. I mean, farmers fertilize their fields and then we get a rainfall that makes that soak in and some of it doesn't soak in, some of it runs off into the ditches and the streams. Uh, uh, and there's lots of different sources for nutrients, even those wastewater treatment plants are sources for nutrients. So I, I kind of mentioned that to show you that something that even sounds good, like nutrients can be a toxicant at a certain level. There's, um, there's all kinds of things that can be toxicants. When you're looking at, at mining, uh, mine effluent tends to have particular metals in it that we would be looking for in the, in the, uh, water quality analysis as well as sediment analysis would be looking for certain metals. I know that doesn't fully answer your question, but I hope it does partially. Oftentimes we're not looking for a particular toxicant though. 
oftentimes we're doing toxicity testing just to see if it, toxicity is there. And then we can go about identifying it with all the other data we collected. We might suspect mining effluent, for example, and then use a mass spectrophotometer to try to figure out exactly what the culprit is. Great, any other questions for Laura? Yes. How do they clean up the streams, like if it's toxic? Yeah, so um, just since the impl implementation of the Clean Water Act, our waterways have greatly improved and streams are being taken off of the 303D list all the time. Um, so uh, how, the question was, how, how do we clean it up? How does it get cleaned up? It's by addressing what's causing the problem. It's go by going, if there is a problem, we go investigating along the stream to see where sources of pollution might be, non-point source and point source. Point source are easy to locate um, because they should have a permit for it. And if they don't, you should be easily able to find it by floating the river or floating the stream um, or walking down it, you'll find those point sources. Um, Non-point sources are a little bit harder to identify, but you can uh, I locate them by having several sites along a stream. And um, where the impact is at, just upstream, and that's where your source is going to be. You might not know what your source is until you do some further investigation. So how you clean it up is eliminating those sources. The community will return when uh, the community will reestablish itself. We're seeing that happen. Once you remove the, once you remove the pollution or the contributing toxicant, the community can eventually reestablish itself. Water quality will return, the habitat will return, and the biota with that. Another question online, Laura, from Jessica. Okay. Off, to off topic slightly, but could an animal infected with chronic wasting disease contaminate a water source and potentially infect or affect organisms within it? That is a really good question, Jessica. The answer to that is we don't know. Not even the microbiologists know. We know so little about prions right now that uh, we don't know what to do with them. Um, there's no known treatment for it. Uh, usually the prescribed thing is when you've got an animal suspected with it, you leave it lay where it's at and just kind of let nature take care of it because we're not really sure how better to deal with it. We don't know how to eliminate them other than incineration. <laughs> um, so potentially, yes, uh, and maybe that is how it spreads, but I don't, I don't know the answer to that. And I don't know anybody that does at this point. Interesting. Room for future future research, everybody in the room. All there you these. go. <laughs> well, look, thanks very much for those great questions. And a uh, big thanks to you, Laura, for, um, for sharing this information, uh, this great talk with us tonight. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Scott. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Have, have a good evening. Appreciate it.